Thanks so much everyone for watching. We've got an epic lineup tonight of speakers. We've got an awesome panel here. Amazing group of functional doctors, technology, activists uh, for here for a leap forward in medicine. This is a great gathering. You know, our goal is to make it easy for practitioners to learn in community. There's a lot of community happening tonight. I want to say welcome uh, to all of the communities that are watching at home. This ecosystem that has been set up by the Meetup Groups, we believe will be the future ecosystem of this evolved primary care network that we are looking to develop. And it all revolves around you. There's an exponential potential to the future of medicine. This is an allopathic conversion machine that we have just created. <laughs> and it has exponential potential because it can be seen by a billion people at no extra cost. That's the beauty of the internet. Welcome to the Functional Forum. Thanks for joining us in the charge to accelerate the evolution of medicine. Please welcome your host, James Masco. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the Functional Forum. This is episode number 50, and its title is A New Vision for American Medicine. So before we get started, what I'd like you to do is just to feel into what that new vision is. So if you could close your eyes and just take a moment to think about with me the kind of medicine that you always knew was possible where functional medicine was the operating system for the care, where every person had access to a complete care team, including a health coach available via phone, including a functional medicine doctor locally when some deep issue came up and some root cause resolution was necessary, and the current medical system in its rightful place as sick care for emergency uses only. This system would be powered by an evolved concept of insurance, where groups of people would come together to share their health costs in a super efficient way, where everyone was incentivized to help their fellow man, their neighbor, their fellow employee, their colleague. This is the new vision for American medicine. And over the next hour, we're gonna show you how we got there. So let's start the story right at the beginning, in the very first functional forum in February 2014. We knew that we wanted to 100x the number of doctors and practitioners that were trained in functional, integrative, and holistic medicine to solve all kinds of chronic diseases. But there was one particular condition that Dr. Brogan reminded us was an important thing to deal with on the first functional forum. Now her talk is still the number one talk on our whole YouTube channel. Check out this clip. How many people here love their job? Yes. So that's what I anticipated seeing, and I can certainly echo that sentiment. I departed from conventional medicine very abruptly after my fellowship, and I often reflect on how I used to think. And I'm sure that there are many of you who have been you know, in the conventional fold for years, if not decades, and I wonder if you reflect on the differences between the way that you think now and the way that you used to think. And I'm reminded of a term from my medical school neurology clerkship, which is anosognosia. And it means lack of insight into a clinical deficit. And I think it's very relevant to the way that our allopathic colleagues are practicing, because I think it's, you know, they're, they're doing their best. They're struggling in a broken system. And I think it's very hard for them to acknowledge that they're applying acute care medicine to the management of chronic disease for this endless whack-a-mole game of symptom suppression that drives further pathology. So now we skip forward to the fourth functional forum in May 2014, and this was the first time that we got the live stream working. Now, most people, when they think about that forum, remember this clip from Dr. Mark Hyman. So we're, we're at a transition point. A serious transition point. I've been doing this for over two decades, and I see many of you in the audience I recognize have been doing this for a long time. And I want to share with you a vision of what the future might look like, because we're at the precipice of that. And we don't have to be apologetic anymore for what we're doing, because we're doing the type of medicine that will be the future of healthcare. A couple of years ago at uh, Davos, I met. Toby Cosgrove, who invited me for dinner with a group of people that included the head of IDO, the CTO of Microsoft, 
some really extraordinary people. And I wasn't sure why he asked me for dinner, because like, I, you know, I'm a doctor, I'm not exactly a, you know, at that level. So uh, I began to realize what he was doing. He was wanting to explore bringing functional medicine into Cleveland Clinic. And for two years he's been chasing me to try to get me to come to Cleveland. Now, there's no way I'm moving to Cleveland. <laughs> but, uh, but we've been in conversation. I said, okay, what do you want? And they really got that he was interested in looking at innovation that was going to change the way we practice and deliver healthcare. And that he saw what was happening in the field of functional medicine and the things that we were doing and realized that that's where the future was. And I said, Toby, you don't want me there. Because if I go there, I'm going to be very disruptive. I'm going to tell you that most of what you're doing is wrong, that in fact you're harming people, that I would want to implement programs that are going to empty out half your hospitals and clear out most of your procedure rooms, and that are going to reduce hospital visits and hospital stays and doctor's visits dramatically. Are you okay with that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what if I told you we could cut your angioplasties and bypasses in half? Would you be okay with that? Because that's where you guys make your money. He goes, I know. You're right, but medicine's going in a different direction. And I think they're motivated in part by doing the right thing. And they're also motivated in part by looking ahead and seeing what's happening with how reimbursement's going to shift to be accountable for outcomes instead of volume. So the amazing story is that despite my tremendous resistance and my continual efforts to convince him why it was a really bad idea to have me there, we are going to start a Functional Medicine Institute at the Cleveland Clinic in September. So that was clearly a super exciting moment. The Cleveland Clinic starting a Functional Medicine Center and being announced on our show. But that night there was also another big announcement and that was from Dr. Jeffrey Glad as he came on to share with us his concept for what he called the micro practice revolution. Look at where we're headed. Um, look what we've done with food and giant, you know, uh, malls and, and big box stores that have everything you can do and, and they've kind of wiped out a lot of the mom and pop and small businesses. Um, and, you know, now we have big insurance. And so we're moving toward big medicine. You know, the holistic crowd doesn't seem to be as employed as the non-holistic crowd, but, but certainly there's been a mass exodus out of private practice and into giant hospitals. So we're, we're creating big medicine. And the answer is, well, let's create medical homes. You know, and I think some of the principles of that make sense to me, but it's just a new twist on disease-based care. So I want to create different medical homes, and I want to use this model. So we've got big food, but I don't shop at grocery stores anymore. I shop at local farms. I, I shop, you know, I go to the farmer's houses and I pick up what I need because, they, they, you know, they, they do it in small batches. They do it the right way, and I shop at farmer's markets. So let's create a medical home. Heirloom, organic, micro practices that are focused on empowerment. Okay? Heirloom, getting back to the roots, the roots of medicine, kind of like Hippocrates, right? The whole food is medicine thing. Organic, let's grow it naturally, let's do it the right way, let's do it how we want to do it and not have that be dictated. Small practices, low overhead, don't charge exorbitant rates and be able to reach the masses and empowerment. We already know what that's about and we're already doing that. Here's a map two years ago of farmers markets in this country. Wouldn't this be awesome if this were the integrative clinics throughout the country and just kept spreading? Um, and it probably is a, a much richer map uh, two years later. So now we were set with our mission. If Dr. Glad could build a micro practice in Fort Wayne, Indiana, we knew that we could help hundreds of thousands of other doctors move out of the health system and start their own functional and integrative micro practice. This set us on our mission for the Evolution of Medicine Summit. And so that summer we set about building our audience in a massive way. And so we came up with the first Evolution of Medicine Summit and that debuted in September, 2014. And we got all the biggest names from functional integrative to medicine into our summit, check out the preview video. The World Economic Forum recently said that the single biggest threat to global economic development was chronic disease. The lessons that doctors learn in medical school and their training have very little to do with how to prevent and treat those illnesses. So we're, we're in a crisis point where for the first time 
in medicine, we're recognizing that the old paradigm isn't working anymore. A tremendously rapid change in our understanding of the origin of chronic disease at the cellular level, at the biomedical level, is uh, in a state of extraordinary flux. There's a huge, huge amount of viral DNA genetic material that is embedded in our genetic codes, in our chromosomes, and that these viruses are impacted to activate or not activate depending on the choices we make. The tide has really shifted from thinking of gut bacteria and bacteria in general as something harmful and pathogenic to realizing that bacteria are really a vital part of maintaining our health. If we want to talk about building health at its origins, well then frankly each of us needs to be in charge. We do that in the places we live and love and learn and work and pray and play, the places we actually live our lives and spend our time. We now know that shift in consciousness can cause a shift in our biology, which are very fundamental at the level of gene activity. Is um, is right there now before us. This is part of today's science. These technologies, in a large way, are going to make uh, you know the tangibility of what your health means to you today present in real time. And it's also going to give medicine all these new touch points to interact with you way before you're really, really sick, which I think is hugely important. The use of technology has to be there. One of the things that I really, really contemplated before I started my practice was how can I connect and relate better with patients? How can I build this relationship? I really see a model that is much more integrative, not just between conventional medicine and naturopathic medicine, uh, but between specialties and between patients and physicians to much more of a conversation, a dialogue, as opposed to a monologue that a physician is having with their patient. There was so much excitement around the summit. We had over 50,000 people register, mainly because they even let us on TV. So here's Dr. Brogan talking about what this movement is all about and what is the name for it. There are so many names uh, around this kind of medicine, right? We have holistic, uh, you know, there are all these other sort of ideas about what this medicine actually is. Is there a cohesive label, Dr. Brogan, for what we actually call this? Uh, you know, is, is holistic enough? I feel like that puts people off sometimes. Yeah, and I think perhaps even more uh, distracting is the use of the term alternative medicine, because I think most of us who practice in this manner, which I think is succinctly represented by root cause resolution of symptoms, uh, sort of resent the alternative placement, right? The marginalization of these concepts, which really are an effort to bring us back to very basics, things like lifestyle changes, diet, exercise, movement, meditation, that have an impact on health that is almost too sophisticated for us to even assess with modern technologies. So I use the term holistic because it references encompassing the entirety of the person's experience, but I think functional medicine is probably the technical term that's being applied. So that first summit gave us a huge amount of momentum. It was really exciting. Not only were tens of thousands of practitioners tuning in to every episode, and we were now the biggest media channel in the practitioner space, but also we started to see the emergence of these meetup groups, practitioners getting together to watch the monthly show and starting to discuss it, and we encouraged it. And so in January 2015, around the Evolved Oncology Functional Forum, we saw the first meetup group form at Mass General Hospital in Boston. Now to have a functional or integrated medicine meetup in Mass General shows that it could happen anywhere, and that news spread and we started seeing meetup groups all over the country.
Now, we were talking about all subjects that could facilitate this transformation. Community, direct primary care as a business model. We started talking about health coaching. We started talking about progressive care teams. But the biggest thing that we really focused in on was community. I had an opportunity to give a TEDx talk in Guernsey, and we started to focus our content on community. And then in July 2015, we created our first episode of the Functional Forum in collaboration with the Institute for Functional Medicine. We actually traveled to Austin, Texas to their annual conference. And one morning I was sitting in the audience when George Slavich gave an incredible talk about the power of human social genomics and our trajectory was changed forever. Check out this clip. It's a very interesting meta-analytic review of a bunch of different studies published in Plus Medicine in 2010. They just looked at the odds ratio of all cause uh, chronic disease related mortality as a function of these traditional risk factors and in addition high levels of social stress. Social stress compared to these traditional risk factors was a stronger predictor of chronic disease related mortality than physical inactivity, excessive alcohol use, smoking and a bunch of other things that I'm not showing here. Now, social environmental pattern, patterning of mortality risk is not totally new. That's not a new concept. 20 years ago, House and colleagues published a really interesting and landmark paper in science showing that across multiple countries and cultures, mortality risk decreases as social integration increases. And this is cross-cultural. This is na uh, internationally. As best we can tell, Social integration is really important for health. Social isolation and other types of social stress are really bad for health, especially for health that involves immune system activity, and I'll talk about that in a second. We have found similar effects in some of the research that we've done. This is a study of 168 women with histologically confirmed epithelial ovarian cancer. We observed them over a period of seven years. The best predictor of longevity in this particular study when everything shook out, social connection. After seven years, 63% of women who are socially well connected were still alive compared to only 36% of women who are relatively socially isolated. Social stress alone in this analysis accounted for 27% of the variants that differed in women who lived longer with epithelial ovarian cancer versus women who died more quickly. Considered together these findings, they point to two really in interesting and important questions for us to consider as doctors, as researchers. Number one, how does social stress reach so deep inside of the body? I mean, in this case, we're talking about cancer biology, right? So it's presumably not just that um, social stress or social integration is just leading to negative thoughts or negative emotions. I mean, it's probably doing that. But if we see these effects in certain models, we start to wonder, well, could it be the case that social stress is actually influencing something like the tumor microenvironment or the immune system? How deep is it that social stress actually goes? How deep can we see these signals? And number two, we know that social stress is implicated not just in the experience of depressive episodes and anxiety episodes, PTSD, experiences of social stress and rejection, one of the best proximal predictors of heart attacks, epithelial ovarian, ovarian cancer, i just give you an example. So how can it be that social stress exerts such broad effects on health? How, why would that be the case? Okay, so answers to these questions, we think, can be viewed through the lens of an exciting new field called human social genomics. So now we had a real justification clinically for building community, not just communities of practitioners around the country, but helping practitioners build communities around their practices. Human social genomics showed us what the blue zones had, you know, showed us at a big scale, which is that the power of peer-to-peer -peer interaction was massive. And we wanted someone who could help us to take that to the rest of the world. Now, by putting people like Dr. Jeffrey Glad and Dr. Kelly Brogan on the stage, 
what we wanted to share was aspirational doctors. Doctors who, you know, other practitioners would look at and say, I want to build a practice just like them. And so we were looking for doctors that could share this in an exciting way. And this is the first time that we introduce you to Dr. Rangan Chatterjee, a doctor from the UK who, as well as being trained in functional medicine, had a hit TV show called Doctor in the House. And on Doctor in the House, he would go to families, live with them for 30 days, and reverse their chronic conditions using functional medicine. He was featured in the August Functional Forum, and then he came in September to New York to talk about what the doctor of the future would be. Here's a clip from that talk. But if you take a step back for a minute, you think, how, how have we ended up here? But as well as the clear financial imperative, what about the moral imperative? What about the millions of lives that are being prematurely lost each year? The needless suffering by a lot of our patients and their families, what about that? What about the fact that when I was in medical school, I remember in the anatomy lecture theater, we were told in year one, Look around you, one in four of you will get cancer. And I thought that was pretty shocking back then. Now in the UK, it's already one in three. And we're told within a few years, it's going to be one in two of us. What about that? See, I believe that every doctor goes to medical school wanting to make a difference. They go there to learn how to make people better. You finish med school with your ideals, and then year by year, those ideals start to get eroded away. So you're left with a sorrow realization that actually, you become very good at suppressing symptoms, but not so good at resolving the root cause. So I believe the doctor of the future is actually going to work in a brand new healthcare system. A system that allows them to have time with their patients and talk. And instead of being tired, they're going to be inspired. Instead of feeling frustrated, they're going to be motivated. Instead of feeling overworked, they're going to have a pretty reasonable work-life balance and show their patients that not only can they talk the talk, they can walk the walk as well. See, a doctor in the future, they may prescribe pharmaceuticals, but it will be as a last resort and only when necessary because the doctor of the future is going to understand that lifestyle and nutrition is the bedrock upon which all treatment for chronic disease should be founded. The doctor of the future, they're going to embrace individuality in their patients and not be enslaved to the randomized controlled trial. The doctor of the future is going to value the therapeutic value of the patient-doctor relationship and actually realize that the patient's views are just as valid as the doctor's views. See, that doctor of the future is going to ultimately realize that medicine is art as well as science. But we can't wait any longer for that doctor of the future. That doctor of the future cannot be the doctor for the future. That doctor of the future needs to become the doctor of today. So by the summer of 2015, we had a number of the key pieces coming together. We had aspirational doctors who could bring interest in functional medicine to patients and doctors alike from around the world. We even showcased models like Dr. Shilpa Saxena's group visit model, where she was able to engage the power of peer-to-peer -peer medicine by putting people in groups and facilitating community to get people well. But one big problem still remained. How could we get the masses into functional medicine when third-party payers like insurance and employers wouldn't pay for it? And that's where Tom Blue first came in. Tom had pioneered a new business called Liberty Direct, which brought together the power of health cost-sharing ministries and direct primary care into a new product called Liberty Direct. And we were so excited about this concept, I signed up for myself and my family, and we canned all the other sponsors for our second summit, the Evolution of Medicine Summit Healthcare from Scratch, and made it the only sponsor. And on the September 2015 Functional Forum, Tom Blue shared about the health cost sharing ministry and its potential to transform medicine. Check out this clip. I started doing research on this at the end of last year. I started, I was reading a book by a healthcare policy analyst on, on essentially the self-pay patient movement, which as this is becoming a bigger and bigger problem for more and more people, is a topic that, that's more and more on the minds of folks, particularly those of us under 65. 
And I come across a chapter on something called healthcare cost sharing ministries. And what I, what I, as I, as I started to read more about it, what I discovered, and, and I've, I've learned that most people are kind of like me, they'd never heard about this before, although more and more of us are hearing about it, you know, you know, all the time as, as this problem becomes more and more acute. But basically, for generations, literally, certain circles of, uh, of people in, in, in the Christian community have been, have been taking it upon themselves to sort of share the burden of healthcare expenses. And this is a practice that sort of sprung up kind of informally and, and over the course of the, la- of, the, of the 1900s, by the end of the 1900s, had, had become fairly well organized. And there were a handful of different organizations that, that sprung up to kind of bring order to the practice and, uh, and, and facilitate the movement of, of money amongst people as, as healthcare needs arose. And so along comes 2010, when, when we're all required by law to purchase health insurance, and these folks very easily kind of raised their hands and got, and got an exemption to the ACA mandate to purchase health care insurance. And so, and so in doing that, they you know, very unintentionally created what, what is a very interesting opportunity for, for all of us to, to kind of revisit the way we manage the risk of health care expenses and the way we manage these health care costs. And the way it basically works, the experience as a consumer is is actually very familiar if you've ever had 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 health insurance before. I mean, you pay a monthly amount that is that is called a monthly share amount into a into a uh, essentially a pool. That money, when medical expenses arise uh, in someone else's in someone else's case, that money is moved just like it has worked for for generations. Although it's done all online and electronically, kind of kind of trans- you know, invisibly to yourself. But anyway, the movie, the, the money moves around to people that, that, that have medical needs in any given month. And, uh, and, and this company, Liberty HealthShare, that, that, uh, that, has, that has largely automated this experience, uh, has, has really perfected it to a point that I, I have personally have found it to be quite elegant. So anyway, the, uh, you know, similar to having, uh, you know, to having had health insurance, there is an amount of money that you're responsible for every year. Uh, called an, an an annual unshared amount. In some ways, it's analogous to uh, you know, to what we've experienced in the ways of in the way of a deductible. And uh, once you hit that amount, the the expenses are covered by you know, through sharing. And uh, you know you you have a card in your wallet. You go to the doctor. You present the card. At least my experience has been that that doctors' offices are beginning to become aware of these things. Recognize healthcare sharing organizations as actually pretty favorable payers. And and they and they will bill in this case Liberty directly. Liberty will then pay them, you know, reimburse them directly. So it's it's um, it's a very comfortable and familiar experience. In the event that it does not, it, that you go to a doctor's office that doesn't uh, want to bill Liberty or what have you, then you would you would pay the the the, the bill yourself at whatever the self pay rate is, and simply submit the invoice for for reimbursement to yourself. So so that's kind of how it works. So that summit was a hit and tens of thousands of new practitioners and people came into our ecosystem and the show continued to grow. It was a really exciting moment where sponsors now were interested, we were curating the technology at events like the Integrated Health Symposium and at some of the other conferences around the country, and we had some real momentum into the movement. Practitioners were starting direct primary care practices, people were signing up for Liberty Direct, and we had a serious amount of momentum on our side. Now, one other thing that was happening was the growth of the meetup groups. And so in 2016, I had left New York, I moved to Los Angeles, and so we took the show on the road. Check out some of the places that we went in the first year. We are here at the Integrated Healthcare Symposium in New York. It's great to be here in San Francisco. We are here at the AIC, Annual International Conference for the Institute for Functional Medicine. We are here in Orange County, California. So glad to be in Boulder. Thanks so much for coming out. We have a full house. We've got an unbelievable show tonight. This time we've come to the IFM's Annual Conference in Austin, Texas. Record attendance tonight. Great for you all to be here. I've got my pass. Let's get into it. So on February 29th, 2016, on Leap Day, we came back to New York, back to Neuhaus, and we put on one of my favorite episodes of all time, where we had a keynote from Dr. Jeffrey Bland. It was a partnership that we did with the Institute for Functional Medicine. And we started to think, if we really think that functional medicine could be the winning hand, could be the solution for chronic disease, then we need to start acting like it. And the idea of new medicine came together with Dr. Kelly Brogan's keynote on that same episode. So this is the new medicine, right? 
It invokes a trust in the body, a connection to the environment, food as, of course, information, and a sense of community. And in this type of medicine, symptoms are a message. They are an invitation to begin to examine how far from that continuum have you strayed. And in this type of medicine, we are looking to inspire an experiential knowing. Right, so what I do in my practice with patients is invite them into a healing experience so that they can know intuitively what their bodies are capable of so that they won't need me anymore. So as Nick Gonzalez once wrote me, let the current system exist in a parallel universe and start from scratch with a completely new system that's based on nutrition, psychology, and spirituality. Prescient man. And the most important message here is the one that I struggled with the most, which is that this isn't about warring, right? If it's not going to be about warring, it shouldn't be about warring. So that means it's also not about fighting the current system. It's not about women as being dominant over men either. It's about awakening a feminine principle in every person and also in the systems that we engage. So as Candace Pert said, the science I have come to know is unifying, spontaneous, intuitive caring, a process more akin to surrender than to domination, right? And in many ways, this is what I'm beginning to understand, is that as much as I love data and science, science is really intended to inspire a state of awe and wonder. That's its only purpose. So Thoreau said that it takes two to speak the truth, right? It takes one person to speak and one person to listen. And it's my passionate belief that more and more people than maybe ever before in human history are ready to listen. So inspired by the vision of a new era in medicine, we started to take our role really seriously in heralding that vision. And what we saw from the first IFM survey was that a lot of practitioners were running really inefficient practices. And it was no surprise to us, even though the sponsors that we had were helping to improve efficiency in practices and reduce overhead, we knew that we had to do more. And so through the rest of 2016, we really focused on creating resources to help practitioners thrive in this new era of medicine. First and foremost, we started the Practice Accelerator. And if you don't know what the Practice Accelerator is, check out goevomed.com slash brochure and you can find out about the most innovative group of physician entrepreneurs on the planet that we started to build a community of practitioners who could transform medicine. Later on in that year, I wrote a book called The Evolution of Medicine. And in the first week, 50,000 practitioners downloaded this book. Now, you can still get a copy of this book today at goevomed.com slash free book, or you can send one to a doctor and practitioner in your area. You know, this has been such a journey. It was such a pleasure to write the book. And the book is really a handbook on how practitioners can start their own low overhead practice. So just before we announced the book, we did our biggest functional forum to date in Chicago. And Dr. Jeffrey Glad spoke at that event, Tom O'Brien spoke at that event, but one of the most inspiring and impactful moments was when Dr. Terry Walls made her debut on the functional forum, and she shared this incredible tip. So I have progressive MS, spent seven years going steadily downhill, ended up in a tilt recline wheelchair, unable to sit up, had severe horrific pain. Uh, but fortunately, I did discover functional medicine, and within a year's time, I was able to be up, walking again, and in fact, able to do a 20-mile bike ride. That, of course, changed how I understood disease and health. It changed how I practiced medicine. It would change uh, the type of research uh, that I did. Uh, and I now run uh, therapeutic lifestyle clinics uh, at the VA, and I ask my vets to make incredibly hard lifestyle changes, uh, to give up foods to which they're addicted that are really quite yummy. You and I are all addicted to them too, sugar, white flour, all that yummy stuff, and the addictions of inactivity. Uh, but what my uh, vets taught me is that it will be much easier for them if I address their resilience factors first. So we talk now a lot about what is the meaning of your life? What is your higher purpose? And what is the meaning of your illness? We talk about Viktor Frankl's uh, the 
Auschwitz psychiatrist who saw horrific acts of cruelty while he was imprisoned in those death camps. And he also saw amazing acts of love and courage. And he said, Be between every event in your life and your response is a space. And in that space, you have a choice. And it's the choices we make that define our character. And so we talk about the fact you choose your life you make a choice. You're going to choose what you choose to eat. You're going to choose your life's mission. And you're going to choose the meaning you ascribe to this illness. And so for me, developing my progressive MS, having years in a tilt reclined wheelchair, unable to sit up, years of horrific pain, was a tremendous gift because it made me who I am. It gave me this amazing story that I get to tell my patients and say, look, if I can come back from that ill, so could you. And it's not about uh, great drugs, it's not about great surgeries, it's not about new procedures or fancy supplements or even organic food. But it is about knowing your purpose, what is the meaning of your illness, and for me, my meaning has become teaching the world that we can create an epidemic of health and teaching my clinical colleagues that we can create an epidemic of health, that we can help our patients understand the meaning of their life, that they make choices, that they can have meaning to their illness story, and they can help spread this patient by patient by social media post, and we can spread out across the country through our social media, that it is possible through functional medicine, through diet, through eating these radical things known as what? Vegetables. And giving up things known as sugar and white flour and doing things known as movement and having a social network where you spend more time with people and family that nurture these health promoting activities known as eating vegetables and moving your body and less time with people who sabotage your efforts and try to keep convincing you that one bite of gluten and dairy will not be a problem and you don't really have to do all that stuff. Reminding people that they have a choice, that they have control, and it's their hero's, and it's their hero's journey to make. So I'm very thankful for my disability, for my years of pain and suffering because it gave me an amazing hero's journey. So now that we were obsessed with building this new medical paradigm, we had to face a realization that was a little bit crushing. Despite all of our best efforts and the best efforts of everyone in the ecosystem, there weren't 100,000 functional medicine doctors ready to build the capacity of this industry. We realized that we needed to take better advantage of other practitioners to do the heavy lifting on lifestyle. And all the way through the functional forum, mainly because my business partner, Gabe Hoffman, was a health coach, we had featured a lot of content about health coaching. We had invited health coaches to be part of our meetups. We had seen how practitioners like Dr. Frank Lippmann and Dr. Robin Burzin and other practitioners were using health coaches in their practice. And so in December 2016, we got our biggest guest ever onto the functional forum, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. But although he was the star of that event in New York, we had also set up these events called Future of Functional in Five, where we encouraged our community of practitioners to come and give a five minute talk about how they saw the future of functional. And in December 2016 in New York, Tracy Harrison came to give a talk about her vision for the future of functional. And her talk had a massive impact on us. You can see it here. Tonight I want to talk to you about the future of the medical team. We all know that when functional medicine wisdom is actually implemented by a patient, the effects can be truly transformative. I mentor and teach functional medicine practitioners, and in the past two weeks alone, I've spoken with a practitioner who has helped a woman to, who has chronic vitiligo to experience the first repigmentation of her skin that she's ever experienced. And as you might imagine, she was so overcome with gratitude and relief that she couldn't even speak uh, through her tears. 
I've I spoken with another practitioner in the past two weeks who has many times helped uh, individuals to overcome type 2 diabetes. Uh, the latest in her success parade being a, a very proud grandma whom she helped to reverse the insulin resistance that that's, is at the root of type 2 diabetes. And now she's off of her supplementary insulin, she's off of metformin, and who knows what type of downstream cardiovascular complications she's avoided. And yet a third practitioner who has an expertise in alleviating truly entrenched IBS. Uh, the latest success being a victory with a man in his 60s who for the first time in over a decade has daily bowel movements and a cramp-free, medication-free existence. Now, if you're a longtime follower or practitioner of functional medicine, nothing that I have shared with you around the possibility of healing is a surprise. You likely see this all the time. But what might surprise you is that the practitioner I'm referring to in each of these cases is a health coach. The evolution of medicine has created a really wonderful model, a progressive business model, for the future of the medical practice that finally, I believe, will allow functional medicine to be affordable financially, sustainable in terms of our time commitment in running a practice so we still have a life, and perhaps most importantly, maximally effective. Now, there are plenty of wonderful examples of the integration of functional medicine and health coaching in the functional medicine world today. In fact, Dr. Frank Lipman, uh, Dr. Robin Burzen are two wonderful examples right here in New York. But I want to share with you a new way of looking at the future of the medical team because I believe that a health coach is the key to unlocking all three of the tenets that the evolution of medicine promotes. First of all, making a practice sustainable time-wise. Wonderful functional physicians do intakes, they do reviews, they do assessments. But a key part of the efficacy of functional medicine is extensive patient education. It's follow-up, explaining the dynamics of biochemical interactions in the body. It's explaining how to implement therapies. It's getting people back on track when they fall off the road. It's doing follow-up Q&A. Health coaches can very responsibly take that burden away from the physician so that they can spend more time doing patient intake and assessment. For the same reason, health coaches in the modern medical practice can also help the practice to be affordable, allowing the physician to focus more on new client assessment and also being a leader in the local community and increasing new patient matriculation. But perhaps most importantly, the health coach is really an opportunity for a medical practice to be more effective. Because what a health coach brings to the team is a whole new set of skills around rapport, empathy, empowerment, and accountability. That truthfully is much greater skill set wise than the average physician can provide. And that's because for the health coach, it's their expertise. It's what they're trained to provide. And so I want to present an opportunity to perhaps redefine the new modern medical team. And I believe we're going to transform medicine by getting health coaches on every medical team. I think there's an opportunity to educate health coaches in order to help allow them to be more effective on the medical team. And while it might surprise you, today many health coaches are using functional medicine principles very competently. And I think they can not only be a knowledgeable member of your medical team who can speak the language and fit in well with your team, but they can actually be a treasured member of your clinical perspective and how to maximize uh, your patient's results. So I believe the future of good medicine is the combination of functional medicine and health coaching. So we started 2017 with a bang, taking the Functional Forum around to the different cities, but also having our first international Functional Forum at the Royal Society of Medicine in London, hosted by none other than Dr. Rangan Chatterjee. It was really exciting to see the meetup groups expanding to UK, to other time zones across the world, and we had a truly international presence. 
Now, in March 2017, we went to Detroit, Michigan to talk about the evolution of cardiology. And Dr. Glad was back to talk about a really important factor. If we're gonna sell the world on functional medicine, it can't just be more valuable at some point in the future. You can't be just saving money down the road. Is there a way that functional medicine could be more valuable today? And that's what Dr. Glad talked about in his incredible talk, which we show you just a bit of right now. But now the new truths are, this is a huge opportunity for us as providers who want to see patients, who want patients to come into our office and see not just the long-term worth, but the short-term worth. So go learn how much things cost. Go find out the opportunities that you can save patients money. And so I've done this and I continue to do this and find cost savings. So the MRI at the hospital is two to three grand. But there's a private MRI place in Fort Wayne, Indiana, our town, that'll do it for four or $500, cash. Seems simple. Procedures. Nobody can tell you in our town how much a colonoscopy is gonna cost you or how much an EGD is gonna cost you. But most of the patients who go have them done who have high deductibles, five, $6,000. I haven't found any place local, but I send somebody up here in the Detroit area uh, to a clinic up here, it's $1,500 cash biopsy, sedation, pathology, 1,500 bucks. You've saved them 35 to $4,500 right off the bat. Specialists, I took my son to an orthopedic surgeon who was out of network. We called the office before the appointment, do you have a cash rate? We sure do, if you pay $250 down, everything is 30% discounted. If the charge is less than 250, we give you back the difference. Got to have these conversations for yourself, but also for your patients. Labs is the big one that we're gonna talk about here in a minute, specific to cardiology. Serve as that financial advisor. Learn how much things cost in your community and help patients save big money. Here is, I show this to patients day after day after day. These are hospital charges for a standard lab pa panel that we order. And I've put arrows on the ones that are specific to a cardiology workup. So a fasting lipid profile, an ultra-sensitive C-reactive protein, a homocysteine level. Uh, I think I threw a CBC in there. Um, so this is, this is a conventional workup. This is going to end up being $1,400, $141481. That's the hospital rate for those labs. Yeah, some insurances are gonna discount that, Hers didn't, you know, hers did some, but her out of pocket was still very significant. How, mu how about the consult to tell you everything looks good? Or the phone call from the MA that says it's all fine. How does that help anybody? That costs four to $800 for that consult because it's a specialist appointment. So your total visit cost in the conventional realm for that patient is $1,800. Now, if they come to my office, and we have negotiated cash labs, that total cost of blood work that was 14, 14, 81, the exact data is $76.10. We charge a $50 administrative fee because my staff has to process that order. This patient's total lab cost is now $126.10. That's a savings, I took out the consult part, just in labs of $1,288.71. If you apply that money to the cost of my consults, that's over four hours spent with me. You don't need or want four hours spent with me, <laughs> right? So we'll review this for an hour and you get to go home with almost $1,000 in your pocket. So become a healthcare consumer Seek out opportunities to offer things to patients that will save them money at the point of care. Be worth it in the short term as well as the long term. So as we started to build new health, we started to get interest from organization and groups who were loving the concept of functional medicine for everyone. And some of these groups were employers, but one of the major groups that we spoke to that we were super excited about was the country of Guernsey.
So for those of you who aren't familiar, Guernsey is a tiny country that sits between England and France in the English Channel. It is a 60,000 person country. And they were inspired by this concept of functional medicine for everyone. And so we did an event in June 2017 where we brought across practitioners to Guernsey to talk about what it would take for Guernsey to become the first country to get to life expectancy 100. It was a really transformational event and you can watch all of the sessions from all of that uh, all day live stream that we did on our YouTube channel. But one of the people that we brought across, Tom Blue, really emphasized one particular power, the power of community and setting up a structure that facilitates and incentivizes community. And let's take a clip from his talk right now. A couple of years ago, I had a, an interesting opportunity to, to enter into this little world and create a product on the chassis of a cost-sharing community that was really deeply integrated and interwoven with, with a particular type of primary care. It turned out to be a spectacular experience. It was The product works beautifully. The concepts, I've tried to tease these apart. Why is this possible? And I've thought of three things, the first of which is sort of science-y. It's the concept that, uh, that the chairman of the Institute for Functional Medicine, a guy called Mark Hyman, has, has dubbed social genomics, I think really accurately. And so it, it plays off of, of a piece of research done from the Framingham uh, Heart Research Cohort where they looked at the effect of social networks on health. And what they found was is that taking something like obesity, although it had to do with all sorts of different things, if my friend is obese, I have a 45% greater chance of being obese myself. If my friend's friend is obese, 25% chance myself, increased chance of being obese. If my friend's friend's friend is obese, 10% increased chance, which revealed this idea that cultures and communities are actually the carriers in many ways of either health or disease in the chronic disease sense. And to me, really creates a scientific and quantitative basis for the importance of community. The second idea, Community, when it really is done this way around financing health care, activates something I think is a rather innate in our wiring, which is this law of reciprocity. If I do something for you, you're more likely to do something for me, which then multiplies again when we're dealing with managing costs and sort of stewardship of finances, which is to say I'm way less likely in a community of people sharing the, the burden of health care costs to behave irresponsibly, financially. The last thing is, is that communities I have discovered, I think, activate maybe the most innate form of charity in our hard wiring, which is this concept of mutual aid, which if you sort of follow the history of charity, whether it's, whether it's immigrant communities supporting one another, religious communities in the case of cost sharing, the concept of mutual aid, at least in the U.S., has been largely extinguished by welfare and, and commercial insurance. But it's something very real, and when you activate it, it's powerful. And so this then brings me to my sort of concluding thought, which is, what is in fact the characteristic of community? And I just made this up from my own observation, so I don't, don't pretend for a moment this is definitive. But in a community, you basically have people that are in some way connected or aligned. Could be by geography. Everyone lives here on this island, or everyone works in a place, or everyone has sort of bound together around a value system or a religion. The people are empowered. It, literally in the cost sharing program that we were developing, there was a democracy about changing policy on this. So they, they would vote on what we were or were not going to cover. So there's an unbelievable degree of empowerment. We then informed the membership. How much are we spending? How are we doing? There was a feedback cycle that was transparent. And then there was mutual accountability, not only through the law of reciprocity, but through the mutual accountability of holding the administrators accountable to how much they were spending, how much they were making, everything was on the table. Journey to 100 was really a transformational event. And if you go back and watch all the episodes on our YouTube channel, you'll just see how all of those talks in their own way influence the future of new health and nothing more than Tom Blue, who really reinforced to us that there is a real power in the correct incentives when trying to control costs within a community. And so now we started all of our and focused all of our attention on building new health. So the first iteration of new health, we took lessons from the practice accelerator. We took best advantage of health coaches. We used telemedicine. We charged a $99 a month recurring revenue, like a 
big virtual DPC online practice. And it was really successful. We got a couple hundred members in, we put them through the system to see, could we get people well with mainly health coaches with, that were physician supervised and trained in functional medicine. And the results were really impressive. For those people who weren't really sick, who didn't have polypharmacy, who weren't on expensive medication, we were able to get people well, we were able to track these outcomes, do lab testing before and after to show the transformation, and we saw symptoms disappearing, we saw inflammation going down, we saw hemoglobin A1C scores going down, and it was really exciting to see the kind of scale that we'd be able to deliver using health coaches at the front and physicians at the back. And so one of the companies that got in touch where they heard about this was Benecomp. And Benecomp is a employer insurance company providing insurance plans to self-funded and fully insured employers alike. Now, Benecomp had a new product that they had actually created 10 years ago called Incenticare. And Incenticare incentivizes people in a company to get healthy, financially incentivizes them. And we knew that that was a really, really strong plan. And so it fit nicely with functional medicine, whose goal really is to get people off medication. I don't think that there's any serious solution to the future of medicine that doesn't include getting people off expensive medication. If you really want to control costs, we need to do that effectively. And so with functional medicine plus Incenticare, formed together, we created this product. And we're really excited about it. And if you wanna hear more about it, we did two podcasts in February, 2018, where I interviewed Doug from Benecomp to talk about Incenticare and how it works. And big companies have already started to come forth saying they want functional medicine for their employees and we couldn't be more excited. So in 2006, 2007, Incenticare was a really strong idea and was actually featured on CBS News. Let's take a look at it now. More Americans are overweight than ever, and now some employers are telling them, shape up or pay up. Nearly half the nation's large employers now offer financial incentives for workers to adopt healthier lifestyles. If they fail, some employers charge them up to thousands of dollars more for health benefits. Tonight, Dean Reynolds begins a special series, Forced to be Fit. For Kim Jackson, exercise is a way of life now. Two years of a rigorous regimen have literally transformed her from this. You were 280. 278. You really do look like a different person. I mean, a completely different person. <gasps> but Kim changed because she had little choice. Her employer, the Benton County, Arkansas government, told her and every other out-of-shape worker to get healthy or be punished. Because the cost of providing health care coverage for them was getting out of hand. I have to tell you that when our plan was hemorrhaging, it was about a bottom line issue, but it was about an employee's bottom line. The county raised its annual deductible from $750 in 2004 to 2750 in 2005. But it built an incentive into the plan enabling county workers to cut that amount to as low as $500 if they were able to pass yearly fitness tests. Cholesterol, lower than 160. Glucose, lower than 126. Blood pressure, 140 over 90. And no nicotine. Get healthy, save money. But many employees were offended, initially. Didn't like it. Why not? I don't want no one telling me I'm that bad out of shape. No one wants to be evident in their face. I think at first you're a little skeptical, like, you know, picking on me because I'm fat, you know, what's going on? <laughs> You're forcing a lifestyle on your workers. We had to do something to protect the plan and protect their access to health care. And I think there's a lot of companies out there that are facing or were facing or are facing the same thing we were. She's right. A growing number of companies are telling workers to get healthy or pay more for insurance. So is the plan working? Oh, okay. Okay. Consider these numbers. Before the plan started, the county health care fund was nearly half a million dollars in the red. 17 months after the plan took effect, the county health care fund was more than a million dollars in the black. Healthier workers, it seems, are filing less expensive claims. How much weight did you lose? Lost 22 pounds. I lost 40 pounds. 54. Did you find it to be intrusive or yes, get out of my I, face? Yes, I hated it. I thought that it was a violation of my rights. But being told to lose weight or lose money has paid off. And I feel so much better. 
Dean Reynolds, CBS News, Bentonville, Arkansas. So you can see that with the right incentives, we can really provide an opportunity for the transformation of larger populations. Incentives, plus health coaching on the phone, plus the network of functional medicine practitioners. And so at this moment, I wanna make a plea to any functional medicine practitioners who are watching this. If you're a doctor, if you're a nurse practitioner, and you'd like to get leads from us, as we sign these employers, we're gonna need doctors in every state to be able to see these patients that aren't dealt with by the health coaches alone. And so I'd like to invite you to a webinar to talk about this with myself and Dr. Jeffrey Glad starting in two weeks time. If you wanna watch the webinar, you can go to goevomed.com slash k P -O. That's goevomed.com slash KPO. And we're going to share a webinar on exactly what it means to be part of the new provider organization, how we're going to send leads to your practice, how we're going to pay you, and how we're going to be able to use practitioners in every state, plus our network of health coaches, to be able to deliver functional medicine to employers all across the country. It couldn't be a more exciting time to talk about employer health. Think about what Amazon's doing, now what Apple's doing. This is a serious conversation and com companies all across the country are looking for innovation to reduce their costs. And functional medicine is the solution to that problem. So go to goevomed.com slash KPO and find out how you can join our provider organization and how we can refer to you in states either for in-person visits or telemedicine. Check it out. Now, just by the limitations of working with an insurance company, we're only gonna be able to take practitioners of a certain licensure into the KPO. However, if you've been part of our community for the last four years, you know that we have been hyper inclusive. We have welcomed practitioners of all varieties into our courses, into our meetups, and into our community. And so I'm excited to announce that next month we'll be delivering part two of the new vision for American healthcare and offering something that will be valuable to you and your family, whether you're a doctor, a naturopath, a nurse, a nurse practitioner, a chiropractor, an acupuncturist, a nutritionist, a dietitian, a health coach, a dentist, or any other type of practitioner that I haven't mentioned. Please tune in from Ashland, Oregon, where we'll be talking about interconnected medicine and launching something that we've given a few hints on the show today, but we believe that by changing the way in which health costs are shared, we can create the right incentives at scale for big parts of the population. We'll see you live from Ashland on April 2nd. Until then, thanks so much for watching. It's been such an honor to serve you in the last 50 episodes. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.